All right, guys, welcome back to lesson 25. Hard, hard to imagine. This is our second to last lesson in the book of Genesis. Somebody, hooray! <laughs> so here's the deal. We've had a blast plowing through the Word of God. Um, Moses, as you guys know, we've been talking about this. He's written the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we're on the tail end of Genesis. And why I just say that is because it started, hard to imagine, guys, isn't it? That Genesis 3, this painting here that Mindy did uh, of the seed of the serpent. When Adam and Eve fell into temptation, they gave in to sin. And then because of though praise the Lord, the Lord had another plan. I don't know if that's the right terminology. He always had a plan. And the plan was that Christ was going to be the answer and that there's so much potential. Even though we see sin in the world, he wants to know, no, 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 you guys, we have potential through, through Christ. And then that's interwoven throughout Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you throw in Jacob's four wives <laughs> and then his 12 sons. And then one of those sons is Joseph and he's betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit. You get the whole story. There's a lot there. And now... We've gotten to the point where Joseph and his family, Joseph and his dad, Jacob, are reunited. His brothers, they're all reunited. And then in verse uh, chapter 47, we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but this is when in verses 1 through 6, Pharaoh, he gets to meet the brothers, Joseph's brothers. They're given the land. Then you jump through 7 through 10, and then Pharaoh meets Joseph's father. Cool enough. Jacob then blesses Pharaoh. You know, in my mind, sometimes I think, oh, they're coming to meet Pharaoh. But it was Jacob who ended up speaking life into Pharaoh. I don't, I don't want to miss that. And then when you get into 11 through 25, Pharaoh, he possessed all of the money in the land. And then, you know, Israel, uh, they settled in Goshen. And this is pretty cool where they had land, they were fruitful, and they became numerous. So Jacob, remember the 70 family members? Here they are settling in the land of Goshen, and they are just flourishing, strangely enough, in seven years of famine, God's hand is very clearly, very clearly on this family. Kevin, if you go to verse 28 of Genesis 47, what you have here in verse uh, 28. Now, Jacob, he lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. Remember, uh, Joseph and Jacob got to be reunited for 17 years and his lifespan was 147 years. And then in verse 29, he begins to plan basically his funeral. When the time drew near for him to die, he hadn't died yet. He called his son Joseph and he said, If I found favor in your eyes, remember this, put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you'll deal with me in faithful love. Don't bury me in Egypt. Do you guys remember the Lord's promise? I will bring you back. Now, Jacob is releasing that prophetic word. Would you please bring me back? Not here and keep me in Egypt. Don't keep me in Goshen, but take me back into the land of Canaan. That's the, that's the backdrop. There's a lot, but it's fun because as we begin to unfold Genesis 48 in verse 1, this is where we're going to go with our story today. Genesis 48 verse 1 says, Some time after this, after he's had this conversation with his sick dad, Joseph was told, Your father is weaker. Now, I think this is an interesting comment because I think naturally in my mind, the brothers are there, Jacob's there, and you think Joseph is just going to be hanging out in Goshen. Joseph still has a job to do. So he's still overseeing the day-to-day -day components. So, so when it says he's told that his father is weaker, it's because he's still doing life. So then he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And what it says in verse 2, it says, When Jacob was told, uh, your son Joseph has come to you. Remember, Jacob is also Israel, because you're going to see these names interchange. So then it says, Israel summoned his strength, and he sat up in bed. You, you just picture an older person, can't you? I mean, in this case, a hun have we ever met anybody 147 years old in our life? <laughs> It's crazy. He summoned his strength and it says he sat up. This is a cool picture to me uh, because why? Because in verse three, watch what happens. In verse three, Jacob said to Joseph, in other words, I am going to walk through what God's done in my life, but then I'm going to bless you as well. And he says, God Almighty, this El Shaddai mentality, he appeared to me at Luz, L-U-Z, which is also known as Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. The Lord blessed me. Now watch what it says. Here we go. As it considers in verse 4, Kevin, if you can. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. So he's reiterating the promises, you guys, that we have been talking about for 24 days straight. <laughs> Did you think that we could talk this much about the blessings, about the seed, about the land? And he says, I'll make you fruitful and numerous. I will make many nations come for you, and I will, and I will give you this land as an eternal possession to your descendants to come. So here's what I want to do, guys. In Genesis 48, 4. Okay, Jacob is saying, Jacob is talking to who? Jacob is, is, is sharing, is this right? 
he is sharing what God has given him, right? These are the promises that Jacob has received, okay? So what are some of the promises, guys? When you see that, what are some of just key words that stand out to you in Genesis 48, verse 4? What would you say? What's one of the promises? Make him a great nation. Okay, make him a great nation, all right? Awesome. What else when you see in verse 4? What else do you see? It's going to be fruitful and numerous. Okay, so he's going to be fruitful. Okay, and numerous. What else? Anything else? Community of peoples. Community of peoples. Where do you see this? Where are you going with this? Jeff, is he looking at a different version, you guys? <laughs> verse 4. <laughs> where, where do you tell? I'm with you. But where are you getting that from verse 4 on this text? Let me see. Communities of peoples, because you have great nations, you have fruitful, you have numerous. Would you say that, that communities of peoples is that the numerous component? I don't know. It's, it's uh, in the NIV version says uh, community of peoples. I don't know. Or is it, read it to us. Read it to us. Uh, and I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will make you a community of people. So that's your, I will make you a great nation, right? You would say that, I'll make you a great nation and, and many nations. So that's your many people there. Okay, so the many nations, that's your peoples. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're there. I'm with you. That's good. No, because a lot of people will probably be reading the NIV, so that's good. Anything else? What about it, the, the land, right? You're just going to see the land there, uh, and it's going to be an, a, an eternal possession. I will give this land as an eternal possession to your descendants. Guess who those descendants are? I hate to tell you, but it's not from the Ishmael line. It's from the Isaac line. It's not from the Esau line, it's from the Jacob line. And what I'm telling you is, is here you have, this is an incredible, a dying man named Jacob, and he's, he's, re, he, he's sharing with Joseph, these are the promises that I've been given. I'm gonna be, we're going to be a great nation. We're going to be many nations or a community of peoples. Uh, we're going to be fruitful. We're going to be numerous. We're going to have a, a land that's never going to go away. So, Kevin, if we can, uh, here's an interesting comment by Hamilton. Jacob might be losing his health, but he's not losing his memory. And he repeats the promises of God. Man, I hope that I get a hold on to and cling to the promises that the Lord's given me. I hope you guys get a hold on to the promises that the Lord's given you. And then in verse 5, it says this, Your two sons born to you. Now remember, Jacob is talking to Joseph. There's a lot of J's, a lot of different names going on here. So Jacob is talking to Joseph. And he says, Your two sons born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are now mine. So now he says, okay, interesting enough, up until this point, we always say Manasseh and Ephraim. But now Joseph uh, is hearing his father Jacob say, Ephraim, all right, this is cool. Ephraim and Manasseh are now mine. It's kind of a weird. And what he says is they belong to me just as Reuben and Simeon. These guys get to fall into the line just like Reuben and Simeon do. They're, they're part of the tribes. Wait a minute, but Ephraim and Manasseh technically are grandsons to Jacob. So it's like he doesn't care. But I will tell you this. What really happens is, and I have this phrase here called bless the boys. And this is exactly what the grandfather does. He blesses the boys. Kevin, can you go to Genesis 48, 15 through 16? And... and uh, I want to just read verse 16, if you would, Kevin. Just verse 16, it says, The angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys, and may they be called by my name. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow to be numerous within the land. So what he's doing is, is he is blessing the boys. And we're going to get into this whole Genesis uh, 48, 15, and 16. We're going to get to that. But I just want to make sure you guys understand, the blessing is coming to Joseph, but man, it's coming to Ephraim and Manasseh. All right, go to verse 6 if you can, Kevin. Genesis 48, verse 6. Children born to you after them will be yours and will be recorded under the names of their brothers with regard to their inheritance. In other words, it's just all going to continue to grow. And strangely enough, they're going to be divided into two tribes and those two tribes then equal 12. And why do those two tribes equal 12? Because Levi, remember, is not given Land. So when you count 12, Levi is not counted in the 12 tribes because he's never allotted land. You guys with me on this one? So it's a kind of a cool fact about how it, it, it was 11, they add 2, and then it equals 12. <laughs> Only the math in Genesis. Now, in verse 7, when I was returning from Padan, 
Ooh, Rich, do you remember the full name of Padan? That would be Padan Aran. Padan Aran. To my sorrow, Rachel died along the way. So now he's reflecting. I'm blessing my son Joseph, his two sons. They're going to be a part of my lineage. Now he's just reflecting on his life. In Rachel's death, okay, Joseph's mom, some distance from Ephrath in the land of Canaan. I buried her along the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Verse 8, when Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought we just covered that for the last 10 minutes. No, I, one of the guys, uh, one of the commentators, I love what he wrote. Uh, you know when you do baptisms and you're getting ready to be baptized, you say, hey, say your name. What's your name? And so it's kind of almost like stating like who you are, you know, like, hey, who gives this, uh, this bride uh, to the groom? Who gives this woman to be with this man? You're asking this question. It's kind of like a name recognition. Hey, who are these? And so I know his eyesight is failing, but there's a little bit of, of everything that's blending together. Hey, just, let's just release who you are. And then in verse 9, it says, And Joseph, he said to his father, They are my sons God has given me here. So Jacob said, Bring them to me and I will bless them. Man, it's such a cool, cool picture. In Genesis 48, verse 12, this is an interesting one. Kevin, go to verse 12. Then Joseph took them from his father's knees and he bowed with his face to the ground. Okay, so at this point, okay, now Kevin, if you would go back to verse nine. When he says, bring them to me, <laughs> I don't know if I really see some grown men sitting on Jacob's knees. So the thought is, is that, because when you receive a blessing, sometimes they sit on your knees. <laughs> I'm just trying to humanize this, guys, because the reality is this is what it is. I mean, we need to get a picture about what this could look like. And so now in verse 10, now his eyesight was, was poor because of old age. He could hardly see. Joseph brought them to him and he kissed and embraced them. It's cool, man. He just, he, he, he's loving on his grandkids. That's what he's doing. He, he's dying and he's loving on his grandkids. And in verse 11, it just says, Israel said to Joseph, Jacob, the grandfather says to his son, I never expected to see your face again. Over 20 some years, and now God has even let me see your offspring. I never thought, I thought you were dead. I thought you were gone. I held the, I held the jacket that had blood. I never expected to see your face. And now I get to see Ephraim and Manasseh. I get to see the whole family. And then in verse 12, then Joseph took them from his father's knees and he bowed with his face to the ground. As one, one commentator, Dr. Tom Constable said, Joseph bows down and humbles himself before the patriarch who meditates on God's promises. A ruler from Egypt realizes the God who promises the seed is way bigger than any country, than any ruler. And I just think you see humility in verse 12. And I, I just, I don't want to miss how God is fulfilling the promises, and how humbling would it be? You know, I, this has never happened to me, but how fulfilling would it would be to be the son that gets to help provide for your family, your parents. And that's what Joseph, Joseph had this part, but he realizes it was because God's hand is on his dad. And so it continues on in verse 13, Kevin, if you would. Then Joseph, he took them both. Now watch this, okay? I'm a visual guy. He took with his right hand, Ephraim to Israel's left. So, right, you got my back. So here's, uh, you guys with me? So Israel, Jacob, his left. So he's taking uh, Ephraim right here. And then with his left hand, Manasseh. And Manasseh is going to Israel's right hand. Okay, so the right hand always is the greater. Okay, so Joseph has it all set up. This is great. Ephraim's going to go to the left and Manasseh is going to go to the right. And he brought him to Israel. It was all set up. It was all good. In fact, one guy, Sternberg, said he stage managed this whole thing. Joseph set it up on how to receive the blessing. I think that's why it's interesting why he walks out how the family members are going to receive this, this blessing. But then in verse 14, Israel stretched out his hand and he put it out, his right hand, and he put it on the head of, uh, of Ephraim. Remember, the one that was supposed to come to the left, the younger and crossing his hands, he put his left on Manasseh's head. And so all of a sudden it says that he switched, although Manasseh was the firstborn. The blessing was switched. And I think it's really cool. Again, I want to say this one phrase. I've said it before. Jacob may be losing his sight, but he's not losing his insight, as one commentator said. 
You know, Kevin, just I want to do something, and I don't know. We might take a rabbit trail on this. We might not. Go to Exodus 15, 6, would you? Exodus 15, verse 6. You know, Joseph knew that if Manasseh received the right-hand blessing, if he received the blessing from uh, Joseph, the right hand is the one that what most people think brought strength, it brought honor, it brought power, and Bruce Waltke said even glory. And so, Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. And then it continues on in the Psalm 89, Kevin, if you would, verse 13. Psalm 89, verse 13, this right hand and left hand I think is really important. Psalm 89, it says, you have a mighty arm, your hand is powerful, your right hand is lifted high. Over and over, you're going to see in Scripture, the right hand is the one that trumps everything. Proverbs 3, verse 16. Proverbs 3, verse 16. Again, this is what Joseph was banking on. Long life is in her right hand, in her left, riches and honor. So the left isn't bad, (laughs) but there's something about the right hand. So this image of everything is at the right. So all of a sudden, remember this. In verse 14, it says that Israel stretched out his right hand and he put it on the head of Ephraim, the younger. No, 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 it's supposed to go to Manasseh. No. And then it says, crossing his hands, he put his left on Manasseh's head, although Manasseh was the firstborn. How many times do we hear this in Genesis? The older got ripped off and the younger got the pass. So give you a couple examples. Abel, not Cain. (laughs) <laughs> Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. Joseph, not Reuben. Ephraim, not Manasseh. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right, but the reality is that's how God has designed it in this case in the book of Genesis. And so, Kevin, if you would go to verse 15. Then he blessed Joseph. So after he had already spoken life a little bit here into the sons, it says he blessed Joseph. And he said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd. Look at that. You know, there's a lot here with the shepherding mentality, but the Lord has been my shepherd all of my life. Psalm 23, verse 1. Can you guys recite it already? The Lord is my shepherd. That's David's mentality. Uh, Kevin, can you go to Genesis 49, verse 24? Genesis 49, verse 24. Here you have the mentality with Joseph. Again, Joseph, and we're going to get into this a little bit um, later on, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, the stone of Israel. This mentality is that he is our shepherd. We're the sheep, and he's the shepherd. And praise the Lord, Jesus then, even in John 10, verse 11, takes that language of the Old Testament, of the being the shepherd, and John, he even says this in John 10, verse 11. Pretty straightforward, but he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so what you have is, is that Jacob says, God has been my shepherd all my life. He's never let me down. He's protected me. He's watched over me. And in fact, then in verse 16, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys. Why would he say the angel, you guys? Why would he say the angel? The angel who has redeemed me from all harm. What's the first story that comes to your mind when you think of Jacob? Wrestling. Wrestling, right? Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord. In fact, Kevin, can you go to Genesis 31, verse 11? Here's another interaction that Jacob has over and over with the angel. Genesis 31, verse 11. In that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I said, here I am. Go to verse 12, would you? And he says, look up and see all the males. And remember this, the Jacob and Laban deal? The angel speaks to him. So as he's reflecting on his life, He's just recalling all of the angel of the Lord and the encounters that he's had. Genesis 32, 1 through 3. (laughs) Doesn't it feel like forever ago, you guys, when we started going through all this? Jacob went on his way and God's angels met him. Verse 2. When he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. Remember this? And he gets into the the two camps, the double camps. And then he got all nervous and then he split them all and all that stuff because he's about ready to meet Esau. But God basically just said, I am with you as you go. And so he says, the angel has redeemed me from all harm. Isn't that a cool picture? The Lord has been with me, and now may he bless these boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. May they be called by my name, and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they grow to be numerous within the land. This is a cool little little fun fact, numbers fact for you guys out there. Uh, You know, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, when they first started in Numbers 1, 
uh, said that they started off with 72,700 males. And by the end of 40 years later, they had already reached up to 85,200. Their numbers were growing. Strangely enough, Rich, I don't know why, I think you'll like this one. Reuben and Simeon started off with 105,800. Afterwards, same time frame, 40 years later, they had dropped to 65,000. Their numbers had radically dropped. So the blessing was very clearly on Ephraim and Manasseh, not on Reuben and Simeon. And so he just says, I'm going to bless, bless the boys and may they grow to be numerous. Verse 17, when Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, it's the only time you can see dis dissension between Joseph and Jacob. Because he thought it was a mistake and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. Like, wouldn't that be great? No, 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 wrong head. <laughs> It'd be awkward. But in verse 18, they have this dialogue. Joseph said to his father, not that way, my father. This, is, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on Manasseh's head. And then in verse 19, uh, I need you to switch. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too, Manasseh, will become a tribe and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his offspring will become a populous nation. All right, I, I did a, a whole lot of studies. This populous nation mentality, what's going to happen is eventually Ephraim is going to be the most powerful of the northern tribes. He gives his name to all of the tribes of that kingdom, but Ephraim is over all the ten tribes. So when you think of the ten tribes, and they call them the ten tribes, they call them the tribes of Ephraim. They don't say the tribes of Dan or the tribes of Gad. They say the tribe of Ephraim. So I'll give you a couple examples here. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Isaiah? Um, actually, Kevin, go to, go to Jeremiah 31.9, if you would. Jeremiah 31, 9, and what you just have is that Ephraim very clearly is becoming the dominant, the, the one that the Lord's hand is on. And so here it is, they will come weeping, but I'll bring them back with consolation. I'll lead them to wadis filled with water by a smooth way with a, with a, where they will not stumble. For I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn. And you just want to be like, um, no. But because of the blessing in Genesis 48, you can say, yes. Ephraim is known as the firstborn. It's, it's the coolest picture. Kevin, if you would go to Hosea 4, verse 16. Hosea 4, verse 16 and 17. I just want to point out this image of the major prophets and the minor prophets. Okay, For Israel is an obstinate as a stubborn cow. Can the Lord now shepherd them like a lamb in an open meadow? In verse 17. Ephraim is attached to idols, leave him alone. Uh, it's kind of like, well, why would you use that image? Because Ephraim is always the labeled one. Like that's the one that they're referencing. That's the one they're going to go to. All right, so let's keep going here, guys. Uh, this is kind of crazy to me. In verse 20, it says, So he blessed them uh, that day with these words, The nation Israel will invoke blessings by you, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, putting Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Look, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your father. So he, he gave this incredible blessing to Ephraim and to Manasseh. He switched them. And then Israel said to Joseph, hey, look, I'm, I'm about to die. My time is about up, but, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your father. Somebody want to interpret this one for me? It's pretty straightforward, but what does it say? I'm about to get, die, but then who's he saying to Joseph? He's saying the same thing to Joseph, right? God's going to be with you. And by the way, you're going to come back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's land as well. You're not going to be stuck here in, am I right in saying this? It's kind of cool. It's really cool. And in verse 22, this is how we'll wrap up. Over and above what I'm giving your brothers. This is really fun to me. This is kind of like the God of unexpected surprises. He blesses Joseph. He blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. And then he says, and by the way, I'm giving you the one mountain slope that I took from the hand of Amorites with my sword and bow. Now, guys, we've studied this for 25 days. You and I both know we never saw Jacob fighting with a sword and a bow. Am I right? We saw him wrestling with an angel, but we never saw a whole lot of fighting with the Amorites. The only thing, a couple things, the only thing that we can conclude, maybe... Okay, now, first of all, is that he is, he denounced Shechem. Do you guys remember in, in 34 when Simeon and Levi and then all the brothers, they took the plunder and they got all of the land? Okay, this is where we're talking. 
He's now claiming the land that his sons fought for. He's now saying, oh yeah, that, that's mine. Interesting enough though, maybe it came from Deuteron uh, Genesis 33. Kevin, can you go to verse 18? In verse 18 of Genesis 33, just maybe it's coming from when he purchased it. He arrived safely at Shechem in the land of Canaan and camped in the front of the city. And then in verse 19, he purchased a section of the field from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred, hundred kisitas, where he had pitched his tent. And then in verse 20, well, I don't know, it sounds like queso. And he set up an altar there and called it God, the God of Father. Now, okay, look, the reason I'm bringing this up is it says he, he's giving you a mountain slope that he took with fighting. So maybe there's part of both. Maybe he bought the land, but then his sons came in, even though he denounced it. His sons came in and fought and cleaned house. And now he's saying, and now I give that to you. That, that sounds like a, a reasonable answer. But I'm just telling you because Joseph, it's kind of like a last minute inheritance. Hey, by the way, I, I'm going to give you an unexpected gift. I'm going to give you a mountain. Now, here's, here's how I want to, I love this story. I've missed this in studying this for a long time. In fact, Dr. Tom Constable, he calls this a down payment. This is a down payment of what God's going to do for the seed. Now check this out. Kevin, if you would, I want you to go to John 4, verse 5. I want you to go to John 4, verse 5. This same location, Sychar, is the same location. So he came to a town, Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, which is also in the same area of Shechem. It says that he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Guys, I've never put all that together. So here you have at the end of Genesis 48, Joseph is going to receive his dying dad's land. And now Jesus is walking into this land that is the property of like his heritage. And you guys know what happened at this story. Jesus gets to introduce the woman at the well to the living water that never runs out. To the Messiah, the message of Christ. I don't know, like to me, you're like, yeah, well, what's the big deal? I just feel like God sets everything up for a purpose. And the woman of, at the well is encountering the Messiah because the land was owned maybe by Joseph and Jacob and, and God just, he just set it all up. I, I just think God is very intentional. And I think God, God actually knew what he was doing. And you know, we can overlook the mountain slopes, but I believe the Lord wants to give all of us mountain slopes to set up the stage for more people to see who the Messiah is. All right, guys, this is Genesis 47 through 48. Blessings abound everywhere. <laughs> and tomorrow, we're gonna wrap all of this up in Genesis 49 and 50. I hope you've enjoyed this journey of the first book of 66. We got 64 my, 65 more to go. And we're gonna finish up Genesis tomorrow. Thanks.